Magneto. All right, let's finish up our talk about magnetos and and uh, and things and stuffs. Uh, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about right now. All right, so uh, moving on from magnetos, let's talk about starting systems. Starting systems. Am I talking about the impulse coupling? Should I? Are we? I don't know. Let's wait and find out. I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> Starting systems as related to a magneto. Uh, the vibrator. <laughs> Waiting all week for that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So magnetos have a fixed timing. Magnetos have fixed, fixed timing. Which is to say, what I've said before, you set the engine to where you want the engine to fire. Let's say I want it to be 25. Now, I keep saying 25 because most light comings happen to be 25, and it's a good close number. But that doesn't mean that the timing is always 25. It's just an easy way to to explain it, an easy number to remember. So magnetos have a fixed timing. It doesn't change. So timing set at about, depends on the engine, 25 degrees before top dead center. And while I'm thinking about it, where would I find out exactly what this timing should be? Believe it or not, um, yes and no. I don't think the light coming manual has the timing in it. So where else could I go? Why would they not put the timing in the, in the manual? This sounds like a Prince question. <laughs> well, when I was there with them, and we had this discussion, uh, because they want you to know where else to get it, I suppose. And the, Okay, so the, the thing about overhaul manuals for engines, if you work on a Continental, well, there's the Continental C850200 manual, there's the 0470 manual, there's the IO470 manual, there's the 0520 manual, the 360 manual, the TIO360 manual, it just goes on and on and on and on. And so my shelf with the Continental manuals was this wide. My shelf for light combing manuals was this wide. <laughs> because they have one book that is about that thick that's called the Light Combing Direct Drive Engine Overhaul Manual. Then they have one next to it that is for the 76 series, one for H helicopter engines and another one for gear. It's like there's only four. And it's all in one. Boom. And it's very small. And if you look at service bulletins for Continental, and I printed out all the service bulletins for Continental, all of the Continental engines, I would have a service bulletin book about that thick. I have them printed out for light combing. It is this thick. So that, yeah, about that thick. So it takes three giant binders to contain the service bulletins, letters, and instructions for light combing. So a lot of the information for light combing is in the service bulletins, which is a very interesting thing because when you go out in the field and you have somebody who's not experienced, they don't know what they're doing, and they have the overhauling an engine for the first time, and I've got a brand new light combing overhaul book. Where's your service bulletins? Service who what? I don't need to do those. I'm part 91, and I, that's a whole other lecture. But yes, you do need those. Um, so. The timing is not in, if it's not in the light coming overhaul manual, it's either going to be in a service bulletin or service instruction, but I promise you that it's supposed to be on the data plate, which is approved data, and it's on the type certificate data sheet. So, so where else can you find the timing? Data yes, data plate or type certificate data sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, 25 just <clears throat> All right, so, but the problem is when the engine is starting, when the engine, when the, with the E and G I N, when the engine is starting, the magneto is turning very slow. The mag turns, we'll just say too slow to produce a hot spark. Everybody know what I mean by hot? It's not literally a temperature improvement. Well, it kind of is, but what I mean is it's a nice blue, lots of voltage spark. Um, so to produce a hot spark, too slow to produce a hot spark. Spark. And the, um, I don't want to say this, and the firing position, the firing, the firing position, 
is too advanced. So at 25 degrees or some number around there before top dead center, the piston is coming up slowly and there's no inertia and you fire it off there, it's just gonna hammer back down. It's not gonna wanna make it up to top dead center and around. So the engine will then fire backwards. And in some engines, it does a little bit of damage and in other engines, it does a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, I'm thinking Continental, they have a very unique starter system on some of their engines where uh, believe it or not, I have the same. I took a washing machine apart one time, found the same stuff. Um, it has a spring that winds up around a drum, and it's uh, locked in, and if it kicks back, it can knock that spring out. So, uh, okay, so we have this problem we have to deal with. So we have to solve two problems. One, we have to make the magneto fire later, and two, we need to find a way to spin it up and create a hotter spark. So. way to make a hot and late spark. All right, there are several methods. One, what is it? There are several methods for doing this. A one. Impulse coupling. Impulse coupling. Two. What do you got, Brett? Starting vibrator, Kevin. No, booster coil. <laughs> <laughs> now what do you got, Brett? Well, starting vibrator now. <laughs> there she is. Starting vibrator. All right, let's talk about the impulse coupling. All right, a mechanical device, it's a mechanical device, a mechanical device for creating, creating, I gotta move it up. Am I going too fast there with the creating? A hot and late spark. Reminds me of my wife. She's always hot and late. <laughs> and she listens to this with Katie, so I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> but I said you're hot, baby. <laughs> All right, it, it winds up. It winds up and let's go. Let's go at the proper time. All right, impulse coupling. So here we have what a slick magneto up on the picture. Um, we have down here, this one down here on the lower left and right. Uh, the one up here, these are riveted pins. These are the snap ring pins that you guys have asked about. So this is the older style with the riveted and there was problems with these rivets coming loose. When that came loose, this little piece flew into the engine and that made a mess. These are the new style with the snap rings that don't create quite such a mess. And let's see, I don't have any more pictures. So what happens with these things, as you've heard and seen, is that at some point, when you're turning it slow enough, that was not cool. All right, I gotta go to my laser pointer here, laser pointer, so. All right, all right, so here we have the leg. If this is the leg, then this must be the toe, and that must be the heel, all right. So at some point, uh, what's going to happen when these things are turning very slow and a lot of them you can barely see it here They actually have a little spring down here a very weak spring that tends to want to bring the leg in It doesn't call it a leg I'm calling it a leg because it's an easy way to remember toe and heel to kick the toe out And so you can see that right now that the cam assembly is it's called the cam assembly and then the other parts of the body So the cam assembly is touching right there and so this is going to pop out and there's a pin right about there and this is going to catch on that pin and it's going to stop the magneto from turning magneto absolutely stops but the engine keeps going 
winding it up. So think about when the engine keeps going, the piston is coming up, up, up. It hits top dead center. And then at that point, well, believe it or not, this is underneath my video picture right now. This right here is going to come around, push on this little ramp, kick that back in, release it from the pin, and yeah. it snaps really quick to catch up. So we've done two things. We've made it later, later and hotter. All right. Um, I'll leave you to write some notes on that. So just remember, it temporarily stops it. I'll add some stuff. If not all engines have impulse couplings, but an engine that is equipped with impulse couplings is usually not equipped with two impulse couplings. It usually only has one. And that one goes on the left side. So if only one impulse is used, impulse coupling is used, it is found on the left side. From whose perspective? Drive in. No. <laughs> no. Left side of the engine. Pilot's perspective. It's not that you can't put it on the right side, but what has happened is if you only have one, the starting switch has been wired to turn off the right side and only let the left side start. So you have to think that through. And I know I'm backwards for you, sorry. So left side's got the impulse, right side does not. If I try and start my aircraft and both magnetos are on, what's going to happen when the right one, if it does spark, is coming up? It's what? Isn't the timing going to be off? Timing's going to be off. It's going to fire it at the advanced position and yeah. kick everything back down. So you guys have seen the Bendix. Those things will actually fire pretty dang slow. So uh, you've got to turn off the non-impulsed one and let the impulse go. So when you're in the start position and it's going to, it's starting, the motor's starting, only the left side is on. So if somebody came to you and said, man, I got this problem, I, you know, ever since this one guy worked on my engine or mags or had something done, it's always something had been done. It, well, it's really hard to start and it kicks back all the time. What would be the first thing I would think happened? Mag on the wrong side? Okay, it's probably, and that's good. Um, the side that has the impulse coupling usually has a big spacer on it. So it is possible somebody put it on the right side versus left. That's totally possible. More likely, P leads are swapped. So that's just a wire. It comes out of one spot in the firewall and it goes that way. And so they just got them swapped. And why would the, what would that do if the P leads are swapped? One, two, wrong, magnetos on. wrong magnetos on. So when they're trying to start it, it's turned off the left and turned on the right. Uh -huh, so you just yeah. swap the P leads, or don't just swap them, actually uh -huh. figure it out. So, so if you only have one impulse, it's found on the left side. Uh, what else we got here? Where did I do my notes? There we go, impulse coupling, that's why. Um, I'm not going to go over the booster coil. Ah, it's, it's, they're so rare. Impulse coupling. Yeah. All right. So if I don't cover the starting vibrator, Brett's just going to have a meltdown over there. Goddamn right. Jeez, we're get that. It's a family show here. From the guy that called me a dipshit. Like <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have proof of that? <laughs> <laughs> anybody? Video, Not what? <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, shower of sparks, also called shower of sparks. Shower of sparks. It uses a starting vibrator to produce AC voltage in the primary at the retard position. And we're going to go through all these slides, and we're going to get down here to the bottom. All right, so this is, uh-oh, 
we got a problem. Mm, oops, I can't really move that around. That's not going to work. All right, we're going to have to go this way. The problem is I re skewed what you can see on the video. So I'm afraid you won't be able to see it all. Oh well. Not really my problem. Um, you can. You can, you can see right up to this point right here. You can't see to the left of that. Okay, so what's happening here is this is a, a representation of the left and right magnetos. Here's the piston with the spark plugs. We have a right magneto, a left magneto. This is the starting vibrator box. And this entire assembly right here represents the, the switch inside of the cockpit, the key switch, if you will. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have our battery down here. Uh, let's take a look at the magneto. So. Okay, so we've got, what do the dots represent right there? Contact Take contact points. Um, we have, what do we have right here? Distributor. Okay, distributor, what is right here? Okay, primary and secondary coils. What's right here? Contact assembly, what's right here? Contact assembly and other contact assembly. We have two. Here's the right magneto. How many contact assemblies we got here? Just one. Just one. So this says retard. That's the retard side. All right. So uh, let me see. Capacitor. It's kind of funny that they put the capacitor in series. That's, uh, it's always bothered me. Anyway, so here's our cam. So uh, I think I wrote these notes here to follow. So figure one represents a magneto circuit with the engine not running. All switches in the OFF position. As the illustration points out, each magneto each magneto switch input is connected to ground through the ignition switch. All right, is this true? So we come back around. It's coming up through here and up to ground. Back to ground. So is it on or off? If the magneto here is grounded, it's on or off? Off. Everybody should get that one. All right. So turn the switch to the start position. Now, this one's off now. Why is this one off? The right does not have a retard breaker, so we have retard breaker. So, okay, turn the ignition switch to start position. Um, lines in the illustration indicate the circuit path. I made those lines, I think. The starter solenoid engages, energizes, but then the starter engages. Uh, engage, oh, see, I did say engages the starter and turns the crankshaft. Okay, the vibrator pulse. Now, what the vibrator is doing down here is it's, it's funny how it works, it's actually quite simple is that we're going to get power through a coil and this coil is connected can you guys see that or pen so if i do a little bit larger i have a coil and the coil comes back around to a switch that is normally closed we go back one there it is normally closed normally closed and we'll just make it more simplistic and we'll just kind of go like this and so it is normally closed so we'll make it normally oh that was just beautiful thank you for that good job Joe. i know can you set the back one yeah it z but it didn't want to work all right so all right, back to where we were There, okay, end, end with that. All right, now, second line. So, normally closed. So if I connect this to a battery, what's gonna happen? Okay, come through here, the coil's gonna energize. Coil has a magnetic effect that's gonna do what to the switch? Open it, what happens to the circuit when it opens? We'll put a spring there, that's a spring holding it holding it up. So energize the coil, this opens up. What happens? De-energizes the coil. De the coil. So I lose the magnetic lines of flux and the spring takes over and what happens? It's closed. Close the switch. Yeah. Follow that? Yeah. So every time you get a little bit of, every time current flows through here, it opens the switch. Every time it opens the switch, the current stops. Every time the current stops, it closes the switch. Every time the switch closes, it 
has current flow. So every time a current flows, it opens a switch. So what's that switch doing? It's like a six-year-old next to a light switch. Okay. So it's going. It's uh, and the monkey flips the switch. Who? <laughs> I was on that card. So anyway, so that's what's going on right over there. So what when that happens, you get chopped DC going out somewhere. Where is it going to go? So we have the battery comes in, and it's doing just what I said it does, and it gets that vibrator going. And so we have chopped DC is going to come out, come back around, go through the retard breaker points, and in this case, not do much. So um, the starting still noises. Okay, both left magneto. The right magneto is grounded through the ignition switch. Yeah, I got all that. All right, so we've got this going. Oh, I think it goes around to ground. So it does, it goes around to ground. So right now we're making all this chopped DC and it's finding its way up through, around, and going to ground. ground. So what good is that doing me? It's not doing anything. Well, that's a good thing right now because where's my distributor? Right in the middle of nowhere. It's not, is it aiming at this cylinder? No. This one, this one? No, it's just in the middle of nowhere. So I don't want my magneto to do anything. I need it to be off, please. All right, so now, if I got this right, when the crankshaft reaches full advance, full advance, that's the, say, 25 degrees before top dead center where it's normally supposed to work. Um, the advanced contacts, that's the normal contacts right here and right here, so we can see the normal contacts open. But I don't want it to fire yet, right? Why not? I still need it late. I'm still trying to start it with the starter. So what's happening here? Okay, so this opened up, which normally would cause a spark, right? Yes. Okay, but it's not. It's still still not working and still going. Um, so let me think. So this is the starting vibrator still going around to ground. This one over here is currently off. Um, I should show that here going back to ground somewhere. I know I do over this one going back to the start. This one's going back to ground. Um, this one's, uh, let's see. I don't know if I can find a path to ground, but it's currently off. All right, so we don't want it to fire, and hey, it didn't. But now we've reached that retard spot, or it's, it's much later, not retard, it's much later now, uh, near top center. So when the crankshaft reaches the piston top center, ooh, look at that, that's even working there, top center. Now I want it to spark, right? So now the retard breaker opens. It killed that path to ground. If I go back one, it had a path to ground. Don't want that. I've killed off the path to ground, so now this chop DC is going through which coil? Primary coil. Primary. So I've got pulsations going through the primary coil. That is going to, as we talked about, so now I've got a chop DC with changes going through the primary coil, so I've got expansion, collapse, expand, collapse, expand. What's that gonna do to the secondary? Charles Park. All right, so that's gonna induce a rapid and continuous change in the secondary, mm -hmm. and I'm going to, and is, that will spark as fast as this thing is opening and closing. So that exactly is the capacitor be next to the switch. Right here? Why? What's that? It's wrong, right? The capacitor. I think so, yeah. So that <laughs> doesn't make sense to me because it's not AC. So it should be like in parallel to the switch, right? I would want to draw it down here and then like that, but. Uh, it's the way they keep drawing it. I don't get that one. All right, so let's see. What did I write? Uh, vibrator pulses pass through the primary winding. The left magneto induces high voltage in the secondary winding. High voltage transmits through the distributor to the spark plug. And the magneto will continue to supply a retarded spark as long as the switch remains in the start position. And the retard breaker point is open. Release the ignition switch. He's right now, I can see it's down here in the start. That just connects through. That goes to ground. This one is battery coming in. Release the switch to both. So now we add the both. So it's just open, open, which means that's on and we lose the power to the vibrator. So release the ignition switch to the both. The circuit changes to normal. Magnetos fire it's the specified ignition position. The vibrator and starter disconnected. Both plugs fire normally and then it runs off of the normal breaker. Yay. So, Kevin. Yeah. When I think of shower of sparks, uh -huh. I'm, like I'm seeing like a grinder hitting metal and like, you know, a shower. 
but this is not necessarily that. I mean, it's not showering sparks into the cylinder. A more appropriate name might have been a continuous spark okay. box. I'm just trying to think of the difference between. Okay, so like what? An actual, because I mean, when you run up, well, I guess it's at a slow RPM. The, the best way I could, I could do this is if I took you over to the lab and we put a spark plug in the spark plug tester, mm -hmm. which uses a, a, it uses the same thing to test the spark plugs. There's, you put it in the spark plug machine, you add that compressed air, you push a red button, and it sparks. It's just a continuous spark. So it's like you basically like you're holding the magneto on one second taser, or like the distributor. <laughs> you know what? That's probably the best. Did anybody have a taser on him? <laughs> but it's no, I actually yeah. did it the yeah. truck. That's I know. So it is. It's like starting a barbecue, maybe. You know, you oh, it's exactly it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. The the new, not the one where every time you push it gets one spark. No, you press it. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Or a taser. Taser's like Yeah. All right. Don't tase me, bro. All right. <laughs> a lot of things in my vocabulary. You don't, you, you don't know me. <laughs> All right, so those are the two starting systems that I wanted to go over. Uh, let me see. Let's just go through some of my PowerPoint slides here. Fill in some of the blanks. All right, we cover it. All right, so we talked about impulse couplings. We're going to talk again about installing mags on engines it's really more of a next semester thing so I guess we'll just skip it won't we uh, you guys love that one right okay some of those pens don't them. What is the red? What is the red tooth anywhere within this window tell us? Does not tell me e gap. What does e gap mean? What does e gap mean? No, e gap does not mean ten degrees anything. Number of degrees past neutral, at which the points open. Do the points open for every single time it's going to spark? To every single cylinder? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's how it works. So this one right here has four, four different sparking holes. So how many times are the points going to open to fire all of those? Okay, question I never thought I'd have to ask. All right. So does this line indicate E gap? No, because that doesn't make sense. This this represents the number of degrees. Oh, you can't even see this because the picture goes right here. But number of degrees be, uh, before top dead center, which points open. No, it does not. What does the red tooth mean? It means number one is fixing a fire. Fixing a fire? <laughs> <laughs> this red tooth simply indicates that whichever one of these is the number one cylinder, that it's going to fire that one. There's two ways to find this out, well, several ways. Um, one of which is you could just put your finger over it and turn it until you get a shock. Um, there is a thing called sparking them out. I don't do that. It's ridiculous if you ask me. But you can take and put the whole thing on a metal bench with your spark plug leads and then kind of rotate this a bunch of times and try and snap it until you get the one spark. So, okay, that's the one. But uh, the manufacturers set it up so that when you look in the window and you see the red tooth. Let me see if I can get my red tooth. Does this one even have a red tooth? No, it doesn't. I built this thing. So, all right. So when the red tooth is in the window, it means that the finger, distributor finger, is pointing at the number one cylinder. So that's all that means. All right. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll say this now because it's worth saying and it's a great story. So you guys have now experienced what it's like to try and time this, some of you. And so you put it in a spot and it kind of wants to wander away, right? So now imagine you, you get the red tooth in the window and you put the engine, so I said, when you, when you time an engine, it's three steps. Put the engine where number one's supposed to fire, put this where number one is supposed to fire, and you put them together. It's not hard. So you put the engine where it's supposed to fire, and they stay put. 
because of the friction of the rings and stuff. And you put this where it's supposed to fire, and you bump it, and it ro rolls off because you have it in the neutral position, and it just wants to, and, and it doesn't stay, it rolls off. And so you're trying to put it in, you know, you're fighting, and there's very little room back there, and you bump it, and it's put it together, and like, ah, oh, dang it, it's way off now. And you got to, so some genius, super genius, came up with this idea that in this little hole where the red tooth is showing with this little plastic gear, you would take this metal thing and screw it in there and it would grab onto these little teeth and hold it in place. Genius. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> so, so uh, in my shop, um, we didn't use these things, but we had a Magneto shop and we had uh, my, my guy who was uh, very careful at everything he did, a great aircraft mechanic, built a set, the whole set for an entire aircraft, a Skymaster, right? That's the ones we have outside with the engine in the front, engine in the back. So how many Magnetos would that be? Four. Four mags. So you overhauled all four mags. We sent them back to the mechanic, not our mechanic, some other mechanic who installed them. The pilot took his plane for his $800 hamburger and lost one engine and barely made it in on the second. And so Monday morning, boy, they were ready for us, man. That phone call rang, and man, you almost killed this guy, and how dare you, and your mags, and this and that. And my mag guy, of course, he turns white, and he's like, I've never made a mistake like this ever. And please bring the mags in. They truck them in right away. You know, the guy shows up, and my mechanic opened up, and every single one of them, where the red tooth was, was broken off and missing, except for the one that worked, which was cracked and leaning halfway to the next. So I say, don't ever, ever use one of these things. Unless you, let's try to kill somebody. This is a perfect way to do it. That's my, that's my opinion, and I'm going to stick to it. You'll never catch me putting this on my aircraft. Because all it takes when you're putting that magneto in is to, once, it's, once this gear is engaged with the engine, if you move it, even the slightest bit of pressure back and forth on this, you're stressing out that plastic tooth. Now somebody who actually was quite smart made something like this made out of some sort of rubber it's a very soft rubber and so if you put enough pressure on it the rubber just gives way eh, okay if you want to use that fine but don't yes Are you so, your case? <laughs> no. now we're gonna get to Tim <laughs> so, come up here and tell everybody was did the mechanic that installed the Magneto just leave that in there, or is it just when he was moving it? All it takes is a little bit of movement, and it'll break those teeth. Right. All right. Now, slick, slick Magnetos, they have a different system. Pretty slick. I don't remember what Tim did, but apparently you guys do. So this is the back of a slick Magneto, and it has three holes, L, X, and R. Care to guess what the L and the R are for? Left hand rotating, right hand rotating. Okay, left hand rotating and right hand rotating. rotating. Well, there's a big difference between it went on the left side of the engine and it went on the right hand side of the engine. Okay, that'll mess you up. This stands for which way it rotates. So I get people do that all the time. So the, if it goes on the left side, they'll put it in the left hole. If it goes on the right side, they'll put it in the right. I'm like, okay, it doesn't work that way. So anyway, so what happens is there's a pin, a pin that goes kind of a blurry picture, pin that will go inside of the hole when there's some holes in there that line up, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys that at some other point, um, and you put the pin in, but it's sort of the same thing. Everything in there is plastic, and apparently somebody last semester had their pin in and was carefully putting the magneto in and heard me say a hundred times, when you slide it in, pull the pin out immediately. But what happened? Oh, he turned that prop. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I didn't turn the prop. Definitely. Apparently, somebody, somebody who wasn't involved in a project came up to somebody else's project and turned the prop. <laughs> yeah. Bent the pin over inside. You have to take the whole magneto apart. Yeah. If it was an airworthy mag, it that's would be. That's where I got okay. yeah. the best part. So when you put it in, you're pulling it off? That's yes. I, I have a, my thing is, all right, so it's very, mind you, it's, it's hard to get inside of an engine. You usually have room for one hand. So you slide it in, engage it into the engine. I grab the pin and I pull my hand out. It's just that, just that fast. I don't, I don't take my hand off and 
you know, grab my soda or whatever, it just instantly comes out. Don't leave it in there because when you do this procedure, you're gonna end up moving the prop a little bit. And if you leave it in there, you are gonna do some damage. If it's here at school, you're just gonna bend the pin over and have to take it all apart and fix it. If it's out in the field, you really should replace all the components in the magneto, which is going to cost you a lot of money. Okay, engines, the engine ran great after that. Yeah, this slide reminds me to tell you of two things. Um, one thing, uh, there, was an, there is an airworthiness directive um, that happened. There is a company, which I won't mention the name, just because now it's on YouTube, not on be sued. There is a company. Um, was it Rhino? <laughs> Pesno? <laughs> who there's a thing called new old stock all right and there was a time not that long ago when uh, a bunch of people got together and realized that selling drugs drug dealing although it was extremely lucrative there was a lot of rules and laws you can go to jail but selling bogus aircraft parts made way more money and there was no real laws against it so Bogus aircraft parts became a huge thing. There are stories of guys hanging out in dumpsters behind major engine manufacturers, especially turbine engines, grabbing stuff out of the dumpster, reselling it. Uh, and so that's why you hear these rules now about you know making something, completely destroying it. Uh, then there's stuff called new old stock. Uh, for example, the Continental 220 radial engine for aircraft came in this uh, version very similar with a short shaft that they used in tanks. So almost all of the same parts made by the same manufacturer. This is World War II. So all of this stuff went into, you know, out there. And, and what I believe is there's a bunch of people who actually went out and bought all these old tank engines, took them apart. Was a tank cylinder, but now it's an aircraft cylinder. Was it a tank piston? Now it's, you know, everything but the crankshaft was pretty much the same. So you'd have this new old stock. And there was a company who was actually producing boxes like it, like, that would say Continental aircraft motors on it and putting stuff in boxes. I, I you get valves like, well, how did I get a Continental? That even looks like a new box, you know, not even a World War II box. Well, I guess it became so lucrative at one point, and these gears went on the back of small Continentals. They became kind of hard to find, and they're very expensive. Uh, last I looked, something like this is, uh, I don't know, five, seven hundred dollars per gear. So they decided to start making gears, and these gears started to fail. And when the gear fails, then the magneto doesn't work. And when the magneto doesn't work, the take you to the crash site. Take you to the crank shaft. Take you to the crash site. So they produce these bogus gears. Guess what I have? To find it. They have a bogus gear. That's one of them. Really? Yeah. And the way you can tell is not the best picture. But I could, there's a lot of space right here. And. These look really nice in this picture, even though the picture is kind of a poor resolution photo. Uh, these look real nice, but the real ones, they almost look like they were cut with a dull rock sometimes. And you think, well, that just looks like really crappy workmanship. Hey, that's the real one. Then you look at this one and it's like, wow, that's really nice. Except there's hardly any room right here on this edge. And this one's actually dirty. It's been used and uh, in production. It came out of somebody's engine, but that's a bogus gear. And so there's an airworthiness directive about uh, this company selling these things, and it's still out there. Oh, but more importantly, this is an interesting thing. So when you are timing one of these to an engine, uh, Bendix, Slick doesn't have this problem, but this one, you're only limited to this much space. So you put the engine where the engine's supposed to fire, you put the mag where the mag's supposed to fire, you put them together, well, then you fine tune it. You just rock it back and forth until and you'll, you'll learn this next semester. But every now and then you're gonna to get to a situation where you, you put it on the aircraft and there's a stud and it's gotta go more this way. So you take it off and you move it a tooth and now it's gotta go more that way. And the solution I've, I've literally seen people in the field do this is they take a file and they start filing away these ears. <laughs> now if you can find that in the manual where it allows you to do that, boy, there's a big lunch in it for you and all your family. So. You don't have enough room this way. You don't have enough room that way. What are you going to do? You're like, I need a half a tooth. I am half a tooth wrong. Well, here's the funny thing. If you were to follow this, and I don't have a real, is that, no, sorry. If you were to follow that, or if I could even take this one, I'm trying to do it so you can all see it. 
If I follow this, this there's a little a groove right here. If I follow this groove up this side, that groove is going to fall right in between two teeth. And if I follow the groove to the other side, here's the groove right there. We'll say it goes this way. So it's right here. Oops, I need red. red. That groove is going to end up right here. It's going to line up with that. And if I follow it right across the magneto perfectly, it's going to line up right on a tooth. So if I take this gear off and rotate it 180 degrees, it is the exact same thing as a half a tooth. You follow that? Yeah. So right now it's like this. If I take this gear off and turn it around 180 degrees, what's going to be right here? Tooth. A tooth will be right here. And what's going to be on this side? You'll have a tooth here and a tooth here. So rotate any gear 180 like that, and you're going to get a half a tooth. So if you ever get a magneto that right before you decide you're going to file this bigger, you take the gear off, rotate it 180, put it back on, and you're going to find that it lines up dead center. That right there is a trick that will save you some. Yup. You look confused. That's the magneto drive gear. That's the gear that goes here on the that gear. Oh, it's not in the bending thing. No. Oh, okay. Now this gear won't because it's got a keyway. But a lot of these gears don't have. They're they're built like this. Gotcha. All, right. All right. What else we got? We've covered that. All right. What kind of mag is this? Dual mag. Dual mag, also known as the D two thousand, D three thousand. Uh, okay, what parts are shared in this? Rotating, rotating, rotating magnet, magnet. Impulse, coupling. impulse coupling, and housing. This is the engine that it goes on. So you can see how there's, it's not that you had an option. There is no other drive spot for a magneto, as where something that took two magnetos would have a drive spot here and a drive spot here. This right here is an oil filter adapter. So, so that's where it goes. Uh, spark plugs. What's the difference between a hot spark plug and a cold spark plug? Oh boy, you're going to ask me that one. Oh, it's in the Q&A. So I know. All right, so we should probably get into some spark plugs here. What do we got spark plugs? Uh, get into them. This is a uh, regular, I call that a regular massive electrode. This is the fine wire, and this is the, um, it's one the 152s use. All right, we'll talk about spark plugs. Tell you what, let's take a break and we'll come back and talk about spark plugs.